Okay, let's get started. So, uh, I think today the, the topic will be becoming even uh, more interesting now. So, the time, I, in fact, I, I organized the material partly in terms of the complexity, the freshness, and partly also is there is a chronicle order of that. For example, last time I talked about uh, HMM and CRF, they were invented roughly 30 years ago, 20 years ago. And today we're going to learn some technique and uh, also dive into a model which was invented roughly 15 or 14 years ago. Okay, when I just graduated from grad school, I was partly involved in working on that model. And down the road, you will see some model maybe invented uh, yesterday presented in the, in the class. That's actually the fun part of preparing a teaching material. I always want to bring in the, the new materials, put them in the context of older ones and see how things evolve. So we're going to talk about variational inference, which is a big deal 15 years ago in this whole field. It's just like deep learning nowadays. You will go to NIPS and see a third or maybe a half of the papers are variational inference. Now, of course, you see very few because uh, the problems are more or less understood and, uh, and also uh, having some legitimate solutions. But also this uh, technique of variational inferences have been uh, tremendously evolved and maybe even abused nowadays to do a lot of things that it's not supposed to do, but we'll see why that's the case. So just go back to the bigger topic of uh, inference in graphical models. Let's uh, just uh, do a recap. So we begin with a graphical model. In this case, I use a uh, undirect graphical model as the general representation because you can imagine that each of these part could just be a local conditional or a marginal and the Z becomes one and then it is actually the same as Bayesian network or direct graph models, right? And the quantity of interest in this case are a little bit more intriguing than the Bayesian network because uh, not only you need to compute the marginals of uh, subset of random variables by summing out the ones that they don't care, like this. But also, in the case of a undirected graphic model, you need to also compute the partition function, which is very difficult. This is just like you compute the total likelihood of uh, data you know, uh, under hidden variable setting. And uh, we went through exact inference up to last lecture where by assuming the graph to be a tree structure and also by assuming that uh, the scope of the variables is uh, finite and uh, discrete or maybe infinite but, in, but uh, with a known technique for integration like Gaussian, you could uh, you know, both you know, uh, computationally and uh, algebraically you know, make the exact inference happen. Now, what if we run into a case where none of these, or some of these, are not, uh, are not hold? You know, it could be as trivial as you have a simple graphical model, but uh, you just don't know how to do the integral. Okay, there are some strange distributions where the form is uh, rather irregular. Or you have a big graphic model which is just too big, too many configurations for you to sum over, right? So I guess we know at least one example already, like this example. Right? We knew that uh, you can still organize them into a tree of cliques, like mega cliques of this, but the clique size is how much? If you remember, we do the elimination algorithm. We uh, you know, uh, come to the realization that uh, the elimination clique can be what? Can be as big as a slide right, in the whole thing. So basically this whole thing becomes a clique, and that's very big. So how to do exact inference? Well, exact inference graphically correspond to making the graph simpler. Okay, and uh, algebraically, we are going to study approximating families and so forth. But graphically, you can imagine that how about I, I kind of uh, turn this graph into a graph like this, where nodes are totally independent, okay? You, can, you may ask how this is possible. These are two different graphs. Yes, that's why we approximate. If they're the same, then it's not approximation, right? We want to make a graph out of this one, but uh, measuring their distances by maybe a KL, 
to make them as close as possible, but having an entire different structure. And in that structure, you may appreciate uh, what advantage you may get. The advantage you get is that uh, suddenly this, uh, call it a Q of X, suddenly becomes the product of uh, little Q of uh, XI, I being every node. It's a simple product of all singleton marginals. And what's good about singleton marginals? Well, the good thing is that uh, there are no overlapping between any two components in here. Therefore, when you do summarization, like let's say we do the marginalization, you have a separate operations rather than a compounded one. Right? So that's the intuition behind it. Let's see how it works out. Though this is the bigger landscape of approximate inference, a big deal, a big family we are going to talk about today and next lecture is called the variational. And there are a few subfamilies of that. In fact, uh, from a graphical setting, uh, you know, what I just talked about by reducing the graph into, you know, uh, some kind of uh, simpler subgraph is known as the mean field. Okay, so simpler subgraph. And the other technique is called a loopy belief propagation, which is that, uh, no, I'm not going to uh, do anything on a graph. Okay, but I'm going to ignore basically many of the uh, restrictions and the disciplines I'm supposed to use on a graph. I can pass message, for example, on edge, no matter what. Whether it is a loopy, whether it is a cyclic, I don't care, I just pass message, and I pass on and on until uh, I run out of time, or they converge. So this is actually loopy propagation. That actually brings up to the concept about oracle-defined or process-defined models. Okay, people don't call it that way, but that's my, my own kind of a coined word. In a sense, you run some program on it, you run into something that you can use to describe a phenomenon like a marginal. And you don't actually know the bigger picture, what the whole distribution is, but you don't need to know that because uh, after all, you only care about a query. Then this whole process as an oracle can define some implicit distributions. Okay, so that's loopy. And Kakuchi and so forth are just bigger loopy. Okay, you are going to do some kind of organization of the, of the, uh, at the bigger mean field. You do not singleton kind of, uh, you know, uh, subgraph, but uh, uh, cluster subgraphs. Okay, you still remove a few edges, but not all the edges. And uh, EP is another variation. You change the loss function a little bit. Okay, and then we are going to study sampling algorithm, which I'm going to say more later on. There are a couple of uh, subcases. So now let's look at uh, what is uh, a variational method. I think a variational technique was a very old thing. It was invented uh, either by Leibniz or Newton or some of their descendants, but at least it's 300 years old. Okay? And uh, it basically tells you the following. You know, uh, it's a fancy way of uh, describing any optimization-based formulations. Okay? Uh, there are many uh, quantities, mathematical quantities uh, that you care about can be re-expressed as a solution to a optimization problem. For example, you know, here I have two examples, maybe the simplest, most basic one, the eigenvalue of a matrix. Okay, there are zillions of ways of describing what is an eigenvalue, but here is a way that is known as the variational expression. It is the solution to the following optimization problem, okay? And uh, maybe you didn't know other ways of solving it, maybe that's the only way, so fine. But uh, there are other systems, like uh, solving a linear system, where you have uh, this. And uh, it is a very, very intuitive and clear algebraic expression of uh, solving a linear system, right? So x is a uh, in inverse uh, right multiply to b. Okay, but even this can be expressed as a solution to the, you know, to the optimization problem. Okay, x equals to the arg mean of uh, this quadratic form. And this and that are equivalent. It's very interesting, right? Now, why can someone name to me 
why, for example, I prefer this over that. <laughs> yes? Mm -hmm. Great. Right? So this one is uh, n cubic if you invert a matrix. And uh, this one, if you take a gradient approach to this uh, loss function, it's uh, n square because uh, you need to only compute in every step of the gradient a matrix times a, uh, times a vector. Right? And you can do many iterations. And hopefully, the convergence wouldn't take a thousand steps, maybe 10 steps, then you're safe. Right? So these are the tricks people use to uh, reformulate a problem. And the variational methods is this uh, bigger umbrella kind of uh, uh, name you know, for techniques of this kind. And uh, in our case, what is our query? You know, our x, our x is this. We care about how to solve this, right? The, the marginal or maybe the conditional of that. And uh, typically, we analytically do integration, summation, and so forth. But now I tell you that you can also do that by solving a optimization problem using gradient. OK, so at a high level, we begin from uh, a uh, original distribution P, which can be very, very complex, can be arbitrarily complex, and we want to answer queries. Okay? And uh, yeah, we know that the challenge is that it is often intractable. And uh, so how to track that? We make it a optimization problem. And how to formulate that? Well, let's start from P. P is intractable. How about uh, we make it tractable? We want to project this P into Q, OK? And, uh, but of course, you cannot do arbitrary projection. There are two things. One is that uh, into what space you project into, OK? The space of uh, all simple distributions, but with a free parameterization, that's one way. Right? For example, I've got Q. Q is basically you know, re with uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, alpha. So here, the Q family needs to be defined, which uh, I used this little shape to describe the family. And then how to get the optimum alpha? Well, you need to project such that, because uh, this is a family space, you can project to here, to here, to here, or here. They are all part of uh, instances of the Q family. Which one is better? Well, I measure a distance okay, between two distributions so that they are minimized. OK, so remember, there is a, a space. There is a distance. OK, all need to be defined. And then you basically can work only on the Q star. And then maybe the Q star is easy enough that you can do query like a P of uh, xi in a very easy way. Maybe P of xi is approximating by, approximated by Q of i. And the Q of xi is uh, just this uh, little Q of xi because uh, you have the factored way of representing that. So here, for example, I prefer to define Q to be the product of uh, all the singleton marginals parameterized by some alpha. Okay, So that's the, 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 the te technique. And uh, there are long history about uh, why it is called a mean field. And, uh, and, and so forth. For example, uh, maybe in next lecture, I'm going to give you some historical account, the, the theoretical account about what's happening here. The actual distributional family for, in the discrete case for P is usually known as a marginal polytope. I'm going to define that. Just the name, this is called the marginal Polytope, you can see it's a convex core of uh, some kind of uh, extreme points. And this uh, mean field approximation, as I said, across, approx, you know, basically correspond to you know, a uh, space of uh, subfamilies of uh, distributions. Actually, it looks like this. It's the inner approximation of this convex core. We can mathematically characterize that. Okay, And then 
you know, what's happening in here where you want to minimize the KL is actually leading you to the following solution of Q, which is uh, equal to the arc mean of uh, expectation of the energy of the P and the, the actually minus the entropy of, uh, of the Q. So why that's the case? I can work you on a single simple mass. So if we know KL of Q of P equals to what? Equals to uh, uh, log of P Q, right? That's the definition of the KL, right? Therefore, it is becoming Right? And this equals to the Q, the entropy of Q. This equals to the excitation of the P under Q. That's it. Okay, so that's basically why people use this formula. Oh, by the way, why it's called E? E is the exponent of uh, the Q. Remember our uh, uh, Gibbs distribution? It, 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 dips, it Gibbs uh, distribution. Uh, uh, as uh, the representation of the indirect graph models. They basically are using exponential of uh, the potentials, right? So, which is called energy. So, this is the energy. So, it should be P expectation of E. Okay, so we're going to walk through that uh, more systematically in next lecture, but here just give you a heads up. So, this business used to require a bit of uh, algebraic skill. To, to derive many of the equations needed. And today I'm going to walk through your A example, which in my opinion is one of the most interesting examples uh, that we can ever run into. Okay. Because there's, it's more interesting than drawing a network, deep network, because there are a lot of stories uh, you know, connecting you to the very design process of a model. Okay, so now let's walk back a little bit and uh, look at uh, what that problem is. Okay. So we're going to talk about probabilistic topic models today as a vehicle to present a mean field approximation in variational inference. So what is a topic model? Why people design topic models? Okay. Um, well, I think uh, the, 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 the word was really uh, inspired by a real world challenge. It was the time when I was a graduate student. David Bly was my colleague in the same office. and. Uh, at that time, we were reading a lot of uh, you know, uh, NLP uh, textbooks to understand how to process text. And a typical problem, that was like 2003 or 2004 or something. Uh, Google was just basically become available and uh, just become popular. At that time, you know, a lot of uh, Word documents you know, are remaining to be browsable and uh, visualizable. Okay, that was the good old day. And uh, okay, imagine this lady are kind of uh, buried in such a sea of uh, papers. So let's see how do we start a new modeling task. Right? We begin from the real task. We ask more formally, you know, what is uh, you know uh, the definition of the empirical problem in a uh, mathematical sense. For example, do we do classification of, of the documents, which was uh, a very common practice those days. Do we do embedding? Well, embedding means that this whole article of different lengths should be represented by a point in some kind of a Euclidean or some other semantic space. That's called embedding. Or maybe extraction of topics and so forth, right? So you decide that. And then after that, you need to walk through this whole list of uh, you know, issues, like uh, how to represent your data. You are given a document, maybe with all HTML headers and everything. Uh, how do you represent that to be the input, the uniform the input of data, of model? Then what model do you use? How to do inference learning and even how to evaluate? Uh, I think at least once in a while, I encourage you to walk through this whole thing from top to bottom to gain a design experience. Okay? Because many of the choices become uh, interrelated. You may choose an extremely fancy model that, that models everything but you cannot end up computing it. Or you sacrifice the model for computability, you get something that is exactly inferenceable and learnable, but this model is too trivial, 
to capture anything that's possible. Therefore, there are a lot of, lot of arts you know, for you to kind of uh, uh, do experiments uh, to try the best balance. And here is an outcome of one of these uh, best ba balance. When this paper was published, uh, there were a lot of controversy about, oh, it is too trivial, too simple. Uh, why you know, uh, we need to award a PhD to the inventor of this model and so forth? There, there were literally such debates okay, in the committee. But now you can see it becomes one of the cornerstone okay, in information retrieval. A topic model becomes almost the default kind of uh, uh, application you know, when people study large corpus of text. Right? And there's a reason. Okay, so now let's uh, first uh, hopefully agree on the task. I think uh, uh, we want to do the following task. Instead of looking at this whole stack of papers, we want to look at a point cloud so that uh, they will be represented as a, uh, coordinate, as, as, as a point you know, in some space. So what that space should be? Well, maybe the most trivial way is to just represent them in a word space. Okay, every dimension is a word, and then your coordinates are defined by the frequency of the word in the article. So that sounds like a good idea. What's the problem of that idea? Vocabulary might be huge. Yeah, in English you may run into a vocabulary of a million words. And then your article is like 200 words long. Right? So you have an extremely high dimensional problem with sparse data. Therefore, it is uh, not very economical and also not very informative because everything will look very different from each other. Right? So, oh, I used to have a little, little uh, anyway, don't worry. So, uh, and then, of course, there are other you know, more ambitious uh, tasks, such as uh, I want to summarize the data. You know, I want to summarize basic using topics, for example, maybe a sports article, a political article, and how do we define topics, right? And uh, one way to define topic is to use the high frequency word used in every topic. If you see Trump and uh, Pelosi and Obama and so forth, you may recognize it is a political topic, right? And if you see uh, this kind of stuff, like Bayesian and inference, and you may be you know, you know, uh, recognizing it as an academic topic in Bayesian inference. And also, uh, we may want to argue or maybe de uh, describe how the topic, how the world of physics evolve over time. Well, that's actually an interesting observation or application that uh, if you look at the documents uh, in, the, uh, in, in the early day of the century, of the last century, or uh, present day, even the word physics, the topic physics can evolve over time, right? From nuclear physics to string theory, black holes, and so forth. Right? And of course, uh, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the industry, uh, you may want to even describe a person by you know, uh, their uh, preferences over different topics so that you can do you know, uh, precision advertisements and so forth. Okay, so that's a task. We have a whole bunch, and uh, it seems that a, a number of tasks may converge to uh, the same kind of uh, uh, you know, uh, desire to understand topics. Okay. And then the second thing to ask is that, okay, I'm going to build a model that uh, extracts the topics, but I need to make some assumption on data, right? And uh, how the data look like. The data in its raw form look like this. This is the whole thing, which has words, has uh, sequence ordering, and so forth. And the people found that this is uh, a little bit uh, difficult to uh, capture. You need to remember, basically, the relative position of every word, and then two articles are made of different lengths. It's very hard to compare. So then people use a, a reduction, which is known as the bag of word model, a ball model, where you just uh, throw all the words into a bag, ignore their sequence first, their ordering first, and then just remember their frequency. Okay. That actually allows you to do the first embedding into the word space. But as one of you mentioned, the word space is very high dimensional. Okay, it could be as high as a million dimensional. That's still not very good. So what's next? It's not very easy for browsing and for many other you know, comparisons. Right? So 
at that point, people say, maybe this word is uh, too superficial, let alone it's very cumbersome. How about uh, we uh, describe the article with uh, its semantics? So what exactly is semantics? So here is an example of the semantics. Now, if you have a good site, you, know, you can read this article. And uh, I ask you, what is this about? Okay, I was actually uh, a half an hour ago having an uh, interview with uh, some candidates. We have a half an hour, and uh, I asked them to describe their whole research for the past many years. How to achieve that? You cannot just read a paper in front of me, right? It's too, many, too long. So people will say, well, my research is about uh, machine translation. And uh, I also do some syntactic study. I also do some learning study. That's probably you know, a smart uh, candidate would answer me anyway. Right. And uh, maybe he could be a little bit uh, more explicit and uh, you know, uh, justify you know, uh, in their statement, uh, what do I mean by MT syntax and all that? Or at least uh, in me, I could also form my mental picture about uh, what MT is. Typically, the simplest way is to reflect on these keywords. If I see something like in this article, there are words like blue scores, SMT alignments, I'm uh, reasonably confident that it is about machine translation. If I also see the word like EM parameters and argmax and so forth, well, I will say there are something about learning in there. Right? So that's a very, very natural way of human reasoning. To be a little bit more quantitative, I could even say, hey, this article is uh, maybe 60% about machine learning, or machine translation, 1% about learning, and 0.3% uh, about uh, syntax. Okay? So how to achieve that? Well, how to achieve is one thing, but uh, how to interpret or how to make use of that is another thing. At least now we are achieving a result where this whole article can be comfortably not necessarily adequately, but at least comfortably, you know, replaced by a vector of uh, three numbers, right? So that's good, because uh, you may read another article which is uh, of different lengths, written by a different author. I can still use the same vector to describe that, although the numbers may be different. Right? So this is the idea, you know, behind the original topic model uh, design. Here, you know. The representation of our topic can be as simple as a unigram. And we call them call every unigram a topic. Okay? And this unigram is very different from the typical uh, text modeling where you know, uh, we just uh, use a bag of words. Here, the unigram is a topic specific. Okay? You have a different word frequency you know, under different topics. In fact, the same word can appear in different topics. Okay, and uh, you will see a few examples later on the same word on different topics with different frequency, can give you different meanings. And then this is what the people call a mixing proportion that uh, I can describe the contribution from each topic. So these are very, very kind of uh, intuitive, hopefully, and natural thought process. Before you even write down any equation, you can already get this point. And of course, uh, you want to be convinced that it is useful. There is uh, you know, a uh, phenomenon in our community that uh, sometimes people worry about uh, usefulness uh, less than worry about uh, publishing a paper. Maybe sometimes uh, what you often see that, uh, hey, I want to prove a theorem. OK, I, I, this is my beginning goal. OK, this model seems to be too hard to prove a theorem. Let's uh, simplify it. I remove this assumption, oh, I add this assumption, I remove that noise, and uh, I take that out of the con out of the environment. Therefore, the theory, uh, the equation becomes so clean to be proven for a, a result. Then I prove something. But then people say, "Oh yeah, it is converging at the rate of uh, n one over square t." But you never see that situation. Therefore, it is not useful. So that's usually the fate of those papers. Therefore, you see many of them, but very very little cited. In here, the Direction come from the other way around. You know, the author asks, can we use this for anything? The conclusion is that, yeah, you can do a lot of other cool things as I just described. Now let's see how to work it out. 
So just to recap, here is the bigger picture of the thought process. You start with an unstructured collection, and uh, you want to discover topics out of it. Okay? And these discovered topics, sports, politics, arts, education, can be used as the pillar or the axis to define a new space, okay, which is called the topic simplex. By the way, I'm going to say more about why it is a simplex. Well, I can say now. Because uh, if you see the previous like, uh, you know, uh, slides where when I say MT, when I see learning, when I see syntax, I basically say 0 0.6, 0 0.2, uh, 3, and 0 0.1. They actually sum to 1. Or that makes all the different vectors comparable. They all sum to 1. It is a norm 1 vector of a probabilistic uh, kind of uh, uh, fraction over different options. And you're, the space of uh, these vectors are called a simplex. Okay, so this is called a copy simplex. What it is used for? Well, it is used for in doing the so-called uh, dimensionality reduction because originally without those, what you have from the documents are just the keywords, are just the words. You can trivially embed every document into this uh, word simplex. But as I said, it's too high dimensional. In a topical simplex, you're not only, you are actually in control. You can define, I want to use uh, the top 10 topics, for example, and so forth. Then it's uh, you know, a lower dimensional space, easy to visualize and to compute. And then in that case, we have a lot of uh, uh, capability as a uh, byproduct to capture certain linguistic phenomena. For example, uh, how to capture words in, in, in context, right? Synonyms, for example. Uh, when, I, when you say, I have a shot, it could be this shot, it could be this and that, and this, right? So altogether, four topics, all carry the word, or probably uh, having uh, chances to see the word shot. But you can basically you know, put shot in different topics with a different frequency to roughly capture their context. Seat, you know, these are the seats. Even in visual uh, domain, you also can see you know, different parts you know, of the image can form you know, a, a visual vocabulary which uh, could again appear in different contexts. So traditionally how people do that, there was actually a technique which is very similar to what I'm talking about today, which is called uh, the LSI, Latent Semantic Indexing, which was invented in the 70s. And, and uh, they achieved something very similar to what I just mentioned in a uh, algebraic way. So we start from this uh, word document uh, collection. Every vector here is a long vector of uh, a document embedded in word space. And then you can do a, uh, uh, a single value decomposition to decompose them into the following three matrix. Here is the word topic matrix. Basically, word you know, in the embedded in a different uh, can appear in different columns, which uh, has different numbers, but you can call every column roughly a topic. And then there is a, a you know a, a diagonal matrix, you know, uh, giving you the weights. And then this is a, a document to document to topic matrix, where every document now becomes a, a shorter vector compared to this one. This word topic was not used in the literature of LSI until the invention of topic models, but it was a retrospect. People recognized that uh, this one was not too much different from uh, the topic models that I'm going to describe today, where you still begin from a Word document you know, data set. You are doing a probabilistic decomposition rather than a uh, algebraic decomposition, and uh, here, you are going to have uh, you know, the topic vectors of a word frequency I just described, where here every column of, uh, of uh, a topic <coughs> consists of uh, you know, numbers which sum to one, and also between zero and one. 
it's basically the multinomial probability of every word occurrences under a particular context. And uh, sometimes the topic can be misleading because uh, algebraically, you know, they are just uh, different uh, vectors of numbers. Whether it is called a sports or politics or something, that was attributed by human. Okay, the machine doesn't automatically label them to be topics and sports and so forth. But uh, when you stare at the word frequency, you can give that kind of characterization. And then in here, you are going to have uh, also the shorter vectors that uh, gives you, you know, a combination of uh, the topics, you know, to uh, to uh, underlie the, the documents. Okay, so that's kind of a bigger picture. Let's see how exactly it happens. Actually, before I move on, uh, I want to uh, uh, clear a uh, a uh, early misunderstanding. You know, many people get confused about what is a topic model. Uh, for example, you know, uh, what is the difference between, uh, uh, you know, uh, the top model with a mixture model? One thing people used to do when giving a huge document, a uh, corpus of document, is to run a k-means or em to cluster them, and we use something called uh, a mixture model to do that. Right? The mixture model allows you to have, uh, you know, a label for every document. And also the label can be fractional. If you do EM algorithm, there is a, a posterior probability of uh, Z given the entire document, which seems to be giving you the kind of uh, similar interpretation of uh, what I got out of the topic, where you can have a fraction of a 0.6 of in topic one and so forth. Here, the label can also have a fraction of probability of in different clusters, right? So people often get confused. What's the difference between them? Or what's the additional advantage you get out of it? Are you, are you still with me? Okay, at least you understand the question already, right? So here I have a, a P of a Z, which is a, a cluster label, which is a vector. And then in the topic model, we also have a, a, a theta, okay, which is, uh, you know, uh, also a vector of uh, topic breakdown. So what is the difference between these two? Cool. It turns out that uh, in the classical domain of uh, statistics, in fact, it was an interesting story. By the time the topic model was invented, you know, uh, at UC Berkeley, uh, you know, with David Bly and uh, Mike Jordan and so forth. Um, uh, in our world of computer science, we thought it's a uh, new invention. Uh, then the paper got published. It turns out that after a few months, we discovered that uh, in the world of genetics, uh, there was, uh, in fact, not even a low-profile paper. There's a high-profile paper published in Nature four years ago, four years before that, which uses exactly the same model. In fact, a little bit even more fancy than the one published in computer science. Okay, and that model is called a admixture model by uh, Matthew Stevens, now a professor at, uh, at uh, uh, Chicago. Uh, so in a sense, these two instances were independently invented. And in, in the story is like these two authors become very good friends in the end and so forth. That's the other thing. But it's interesting that people who come from different problems can go to the same solution. So what is the admixture model? It's more general. It basically says that instead of describing, you know, a entity, say a document, to have a label of Z, I look into the entity and uh, see its composition. For example, here is an entity which has many, many words. And uh, Matthew Stevens look into human DNA and look at the sequence, characters. And uh, it also have uh, different meanings, right? So here the goal is that for every word, okay, I'm going to assume that it is coming from a mixture model. For example, every word has now a Z. You can see this is very different from this one. Here, there's a whole collection of words share the same label. And here, every different word has its own label. And the label 
is coming out of uh, multiple different choices. Okay, it could be a sports shot, it could be a, uh, you know, a medical shot, it could be other shots. So the same word can even come from different topics. In this case, you have no such option. Okay, the same word, you know, have no way to be labeled differently. And then when you produce the entire documents, you are allowed to draw such a label for every word. Okay, and this drawing is coming from the theta, which is a mixing proportion. Okay, you can see the, the, the cluster or the mixture components, like I wrote in here, are used in a very different way. They are used repetitively to generate elements inside an object. In this case, the words. In the biological case, the DNAs, the characters in the DNAs. And it allows you a much richer mechanism to mix the source. Okay, you have different topics which really gets, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, draw, you know, uh, stochastically to compose, you know, a outcome. This is, in a sense, more natural because uh, when we are writing a document, I don't be, think we, you know, uh, are using one topic or we just uh, use a probability and uh, choose uh, one of the possible topics and then your inference is reflecting my uncertainty. Instead, we actually do have uh, three topics, and uh, we consciously use the mixing proportion to select words out of it. That's a more natural way of uh, synthesizing complex objects, at least uh, from the design's perspective. Right? Therefore, these are the status which are coming from this kind of graphical model rather than this graphical model. Okay, so that's the difference. This is called the AF mixture model. And now I think it's time to uh, regroup and look at the model, how it looks like. So here is exactly how the model looks like. It uses uh, you know, the same kind of uh, rationale I just described. You know, here's a box which uh, has uh, ND number of words. And uh, for each of the words, we have a latent uh, indicator Z. And uh, the Z are drawn from a theta, which is uh, the document uh, specific kind of a proportion of mixing, okay? And then here, we have the topic-specific word frequency. You have K topics. Therefore, depending on whether Z equals to one of the Ks, this one, beta, will be activated and uh, produce a word into this collection. Therefore, you can see the word are defined by two inputs, the frequency under a particular topic, the choice of a topic. And uh, here is, uh, in fact, uh, this even becomes the way to describe a model. Okay. And uh, here I've been vague. As a Bayesian, you know, one of the advantages is to allow people choose different uh, priors. And uh, if you re remember uh, what is taught in 701 or other intro probability course, uh, typically people like a conjugate prior, right? For example, this is a multinomial. What is a conjugated prior for, for a multinomial? Dirichlet, right? So that's why the model is called the latent Dirichlet allocation, LDA model. But it doesn't mean that you can only choose Dirichlet. In fact, very, very soon, uh, there was a model proposed by the same author uh, called uh, logistic normal prior. Uh, there are certain advantages over Dirichlet. For example, Dirichlet is uh, not able to model correlations between topics because uh, the prior assume that every dimension is uh, independent of each other. If you look at the form, for example, what's the form of Dirichlet, if you remember? Theta of alpha minus time of that, right? And some kind of a gamma function to normalize it. So it is uh, sometimes less desirable because of the inability of modeling correlations between two theta, theta i and theta i prime. Then um, logistic normal goes like follows. It is uh, going to assume that uh, uh, I'm sampling this uh, topic frequency from a 
normal distribution, a multivariate normal distribution parameterized by a mean of mu and a covariance of theta. The covariance matrix can naturally model correlations between two dimensions, right? Uh, but uh, it comes with a cost. Once you sample a gamma from a mu and uh, sigma defined uh, multivariate Gaussian, is gamma still a multinomial variable? What is the sample from a multivariate Gaussian distribution? It's a natural vector of any number from negative infinity to positive infinity, right? But uh, the, it's basically algebraic, we say it's not living in a simplex. But the multinomial parameters, which are the thetas, has to sum to one, and uh, every theta uh, is between zero and one. Right. How to satisfy that? So there's a transformation that is needed to turn theta uh, gamma into theta. So, oh, unfortunately, all the translations are lost. But uh, there is a way, basically, to you know normalize this uh, gamma vector. Okay, and then you bas you know basically you take uh, you know the, non the 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 gamma can be exponentiated into this, right? And then you can normalize it by sum over all the exponential of gamma i, and that becomes your theta i. Okay, that's called the logistic normal transformation, and uh, that leads to a legitimate Gaussian distribu uh, 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 LDA distribution. Okay, so these are the algebra that uh, we can uh, forego for now. If I'm interested, you can look at the notes more carefully. Now let's go back and see what's next. We have a task defined. We have a representation determined. We designed a model. The next is to do inference. Right. In a sense, that's the key of today's topic. So here is a common way of drawing the graphic model of LDA, or the topic model. You can see W as the only observation, which are the words. And every word has a Z indicator of their topic source. Z come from theta. The theta is outside of you know, the the, the word frequency, meaning that it is shared across different documents with the same topic, uh, topic weight mi mixing. And then there are beta over there. These are unshaded nodes. These are all frequencies, all, 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 all random variables. Therefore, the, the, the inference task is to figure out all of these uh, unshaded random variables. Right? For example, if you figure out all the Z's, then you have uh, now topic assignments for every word. If you figure out the theta, you know basically the topic proportion of uh, this whole article. And uh, if you figure out the beta, you get uh, the unigram of every topic. Right? So these are the interesting inference tasks. So how to do this inference? Just uh, for you know, for uh, you know, uh, the completeness, we write down the whole model algebraically. This is the whole model. And uh, again, this is to review our Bayesian network uh, graphical model semantics you know, for factorization. Right? You walk from the top of the node, the graph, to the bottom, and you put in local conditionals, and these are basically all the terms that you are putting together. There are a lot of uh, you know, uh, multiplications. You know, uh, here, n means uh, n words per document. This means uh, d documents. And uh, here, it means uh, k topics. So by the way, this uh, plate with a capital letter here is a, uh, a shorthand for you to avoid drawing you know, n copies of such variables. Okay? And we are interested basically in computing the posterior, which are these guys. How to do that? Oh, I lost all the interesting uh, fonts in here. Uh, 
it's becoming challenging. Uh, maybe like this. Maybe we can go, so basically, let's say we want to compute the posterior alpha z, given the document, okay? And it is going to be very, very difficult. Why? Because uh, you need to now use uh, this equation, which uh, needs you to, do, to compute the likelihood of the entire data sets. And how to compute that? It literally means that you need to sum over a lot of, lot of uh, stuff. All the z's, all the beta, and all the, uh, the, the theta. In fact, the, only the z's are summable. And here, it should be integrated by integration because uh, they are continuous numbers. All right. And uh, you could uh, work out by yourself how many terms that you need to compute this value, which is uh, what we call the super exponentially complex. And also, learning is... Uh, even more difficult because you need to figure out the hidden variable first and then make them a subroutine inside a EM algorithm. Right. So that's where we start with approximate inference. So I, I kind of throw at you one of the most difficult inference tasks that you can run into. And now I argue for the approach for variational inference. All right, so uh, variational inference, I already went through that. It's to turn the inference problem into a optimization problem by introducing some auxiliary proxy, okay, which in this case, a Q, okay. So here, Q of Z represents a uh, proxy to P of Z, and Z is uh, just a general reference to all the hidden variables in this case. And we want to get a Z, a, a Q of Z, such that uh, it is, uh, you know, hopefully, maximizing the likelihood. And from the EM lecture, we learned that using Jensen's inequality, we can define a lower bound of the likelihood, which leads us to an alternative uh, objective function called a free energy, right? If you still remember that. And that was the vehicle for us to justify the EM algorithm. And in the EM algorithm, we know that uh, in the E step, it's about, uh, you know, optimizing the lower bound, the free energy, with respect to the phi, uh, which is the parameter of the Q distribution. And we also knew that uh, if uh, we want to do a closed form where the Q is unrestricted for any family, then it's basically the same as uh, the posterior. It's, this is basically the posterior of Z given X, right? And then in the M, we're going to keep this fixed and estimate theta. So if you do this, then we, so, we, we were solving nothing. Why? Because uh, we want to avoid working on this. And now it tells me that in one of the steps, your proxy is uh, just the same as uh, that thing I want to avoid. So that's no good. Right. So variational inference is now to not use this and to try to basically reformulate the Q in a much simpler space so that it becomes tractable. Okay, true posterior is no good, and uh, we want to make it tractable. And here is a tractable queue, where instead of uh, using that uh, whole original kind of formula where everything is coupled, we are going to now assume the fully factored distribution where you know, every kind of a beta, theta, and a z becomes uh, an independent random variable parameterized by some numbers. Okay, so you can see this. And what's, what's good about that? Now, if you want to compute a Q of uh, beta i, for example, you literally can pick one of these items out and forget about all the others. Okay, so that's mean field approximation. And uh, I didn't say that uh, each of these is actually parameterized by some other additional so-called variational random variables. I think it's here, yeah. So this one now becomes parameterized by lambda, and this one parameterized by gamma, and this one is parameterized by phi. These are the new parameters only present in the Q, the variational distribution. There are unknown numbers. Okay, if you recall, 
as that to achieve variational approximation, you need to do two things. One is to find a simple enough family for the approximate distribution. Okay, now the family becomes uh, Q equals to QI. That's the family, fully factored family. And then within that family, there are still many, many choices of distribution. For example, the family is Gaussian. There are many Gaussian distributions. I need to define the parameters inside this family. And these are the parameters, known as the variational parameters. And how to estimate the numbers of those parameters? Well, I use an optimization routine where I got this using a KL minimization thing, which minimizes this Q versus that P. Okay, so that's the, 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 the rationale. And then, you know, uh, you need to do some, uh, some hard work in terms of the algebraic derivation, okay? Uh, so here is a uh, generic form of uh, how that posterior building block look like. And uh, in LDA, you can actually uh, plug in some of these terms, okay? Which, uh, you know, in the, I think uh, this is uh, the, uh, the topic proportion distribution, which is a uh, Dirichlet. This is the word, uh, the, the word label frequency distribution, which comes from a multinomial. And then this whole thing, basically, the posterior of uh, the weights, of the topic weights in the variational, is just a combination of these two. And uh, you can show yourself that uh, this Q eventually takes the form of uh, a Dirichlet with uh, reweighted numbers. Okay, so that part requires a little bit of algebra. You can combine these two, renormalize it. I will leave you to, to work it out. Okay, so we have a Q of uh, theta, which uh, takes care of this guy. Okay, and uh, we also need to have a Q of a Z, given the variational parameter, okay? It turns out that uh, you can also make some algebraic uh, you know, arrangements and derivation, and uh, in the, at the end of the day, convince yourself that this is uh, a re-parameterized uh, uh, re parameterized multimodal distribution, okay? And likewise, for the word frequency, you also have uh, similar kind of uh, ways of estimating that. Okay, so where do you get this? Again, you know, you literally can just work on this uh, equation and plug in basically your assumptions in here and then take the derivative of uh, lambda, gamma, and phi and uh, I guarantee you that you will get this, okay? So with that, we basically have now three equations for the inference uh, step, for the E step, where you know, the, marginals, uh, the marginals of this guy and that guy and that guy are independently taken care of by these uh, singleton <coughs> approximations, okay? And uh, that gives you, you know, a, 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 a algorithm, you know, uh, in current design sense, you know, for solving LDA. You initialize each of the quantity of interest with some random numbers, and then you just keep updating the, you know, all these different quantities. Okay, and then you converge. Are you still with me on the inference part? Okay, if you don't like the algebra part, it's okay. But the key message is that you start from a P, which is a really, really, really hard and uh, you introduce a Q, which is uh, hopefully easier. I I'm trying to put a happy face here, okay? And this Q is uh, to be factorized by little Qs of I, where you need to introduce uh, some free parameters of I, and then you are going to just uh, estimate the eta I, you know, using a arg max, or arg min in this case, of a KL between Q and P. That's the whole story. 
Okay, everything else is just a little algebra. It's very technical. Okay, and then you converge. Now that's the inference part. Very often the the lecture ends here. When I uh, walk through the notes this morning, I feel a little bit too abrupt to end here. I think uh, there is this other piece we didn't even mention in the past. Uh, it's inference, but where's learning? Uh, we are talking about the EM algorithm. How about uh, uh, what, why only the E step was taken care of? The M step somehow was, uh, was uh, ignored or not. In fact, many papers ignore that. Now I'll give you a little bit bigger picture. What we just did is actually known as the variational E step. Okay, where we keep the theta, the original model parameters fixed, and uh, we are going to optimize, you know, uh, the phi, which is the the variational uh, s part. And uh, here are all our variational parameters. So we are going to do exactly what I just did. But now there are additional parameters in the m step because we actually want to know those uh, theta and the beta parameters, right? In many cases, why in here there is no such a thing? Well, the truth is that uh, many people don't worry about that from a computational perspective, because uh, um, um, as a Bayesian, you are not supposed to even uh, care about uh, the parameters. They are random variables; they will be integrated out. Therefore, the theta and the beta will never bother to appear in your computation, they are integrated out. You know, you get, uh, for example, if you have a Dirichlet parameter sample uh, you know, uh, leading to a uh, multinomial parameter sample leading to a discrete label, then this part can be integrated out. And you can write down the Z directly given the alpha as uh, a Dirichlet of uh, what? Of the counts plus the parameters, right? That's usually how people like it. Therefore, there's no business for theta. So that's why the M step was often ignored. But if you really, really want to have an estimate of the beta, you can actually still tease it out. You can write down the P of a theta given Z and alpha. That's doable. And then you can do either a Bayesian estimation or a map estimation of that. Okay, this is doable. So in that case, you need to now fix those uh, variational parameters. Okay, they are the surrogates of uh, the alpha and other things. And then you just, uh, you know, uh, uh, combine those counts. And, uh, and uh, you can write down this. Okay, I'm not going to put an equation here, but it's uh, just very similar to uh, what you do in the E step. Sometimes people even want to learn the number of alpha and the eta, which are known as the hyperparameters. Okay, usually specified people. Uh, but uh, if you want to learn them from real data, it's also possible. You can integrate out again the alpha, or the theta, and the z, and the beta. And then you can basically maximize the alpha and the eta against this whole thing. That's also doable. So I want to say a few words like this just to remind you that uh, uh, if desired, all these are doable, but uh, many people just don't bother to do it because uh, in the E step, what you already get are the Zs, okay? Which is, uh, you know, uh, in fact, not the Zs, but uh, the frequency. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the frequency behind the Zs and also uh, the frequency behind the theta, these are you know, if you are going back to the exponential or the linear, uh, the expanded family distribution and the general linear model, these are the sufficient statistics for all these other parameters that you care about. So in a sense, you already have the information in case you want to use it. Uh, let's see. Um, maybe I can walk you through one of these uh, equations. Let's see whether it's interesting to work it out or not. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting to actually look at this. So the lambda 
gives you a uh, variational parameter uh, of uh, underlying the word frequency of uh, a particular topic, K. Okay. So lambda of K of J is about uh, the Jth word underlying topic K and the, what is its frequency. Okay. And uh, how to estimate that? You need to basically know uh, the counting uh, inside a context. You cannot simply just count the word J, say shots, inside the entire article. You need to basically say that uh, when the J's word is under topic K, how many times it occurs, right? And now you can see that uh, this particular indication is exactly a combination of that. This uh, indicator function indicates uh, the this word, the nth word in document D equals to J, meaning that there's a trigger of a word J occurred. Okay, and then it is weighted by this particular nth word being under the topic K. And this combination gives you a weighted count of the occurrences under a specific topic, right? And then this is what? This is uh, the hyperparameter, the prior zero counts of uh, that word under any topic. So you can see the rationale between all these, right? You count over every word and every document in your corpus, but uh, you know, these uh, topic and the word occurrences are augmented in terms of their topical context. So that's why I say when you estimate these hyperparameters, lambda and, uh, and uh, the phi's and also the gammas, which is the output of uh, the variational E step, you pretty much have uh, the entire thing already. You know, in case you want to down the road to estimate uh, the beta and the theta and all that. Okay, these sufficient things are given already. So that's about uh, uh, variational inference technique. I still have another 10 minutes Maybe uh, any questions at this point before I move on? Yep. Uh, how do you even design the space of topics? Like, it's very subjective. And even one topic can include another, or maybe not. It's very subjective, and also it is very objective. Because uh, when you do this uh, topic uh, decomposition, for example, when you get uh, this uh, topic specific uh, word frequency beta, it's all driven by data, right? But uh, what I think what you meant by subjective is that uh, what this give you are a bunch of numbers. And uh, maybe here is a house, this is a white, this is Obama, all this. And uh, there is uh, a number vector accord, uh, corresponding to these uh, words. That's it, it's very, very objective. Now, calling this whole thing a political topic is very subjective. You are free to call it sports, right? So sometimes, uh, you know, for an uh, uninformed user, they say, oh, can your machine automatically derive a topic? The answer is mixed. Many people say, oh yes, we can automatically derive topics. But then they say, okay, then we don't need human anymore, right? Uh, we will get uh, automatically politics and the uh, and, uh, sports and the arts. The truth is not. The automatic part is about getting these numbers and also getting these uh, word lists. But uh, how to call them, how to give them a human touch to communicate a story is the human. Okay, we need to basically look at these numbers and give it. So I would say, come on, I, I, I'm not a believer of uh, AI replacing people at all and uh, driving people all of it. That's where the human part is important. You know, you, if even two people see the same color blue, will describe it differently, right? Or wine tasting, right? So that's where some subjectiveness is interesting because uh, they understand the user taste or needs and they can put their input in there. But that does result in ambiguity. In fact, uh, that kind of comes to uh, my next argument, how to evaluate. Because of this subjectiveness, Evaluation in top model is really, really a problematic thing. You know, you, you, you really cannot say one 
model is better than the other, especially when you introduce the approximate inference. The approximation also has a quality issue, whether it is good or not. And then sometimes the evaluation becomes intertwined. And, uh, uh, you know, your error may, because of the model flaw, or may because of the inaccuracy of your inference procedure or process of data, all this could be convoluted. Yeah. That's actually a big criticism of our business. So here, uh, in fact, uh, I do want to surface you to maybe a legitimate way of uh, evaluating that, which is a lot of art. Nowadays, people don't do it very often. So I have a few slides in here. Usually, you know, uh, evaluation should uh, be measured against the ground truth, right? But for an article, you don't have a ground truth. I give you an article, you know, you already can debate whether it is 0.5% uh, politics or 0.6% politics. We don't know that, right? And therefore, when people in the old days compare models, they basically say, yeah, you know, I run topic models. And uh, then I run, you know, uh, classifiers so that uh, I classify the topic vector and I can give uh, every document a label. Uh, that's very, very uh, poorly informative about uh, what you do with the whole project, whether your model is good or whether your uh, inference engine is good. And so, because, for example, people can use sampling algorithm, which gives you maybe some different results. So here is uh, one work I did as a. a uh, it, as an experiment, we do a simulation. You have this topic model, right? You can simulate, you know, you can define maybe a vocabulary of uh, you know, uh, 40 abstract words. The word doesn't have any semantic meaning, but they are just words. And uh, I can have uh, three topics, and the topics are basically of uh, these many words and uh, of different frequencies, okay? And then you can use them to generate a, whole, a few hundred or a few thousand documents. The document doesn't have any meaning because they are just numbers and tokens. Okay. And then you can throw them back to your inference engine and uh, ask them to recover the topic vector of every document. Here are 40, 100, 400 documents. And uh, compare, basically, your recovery from the ground truth that you use to synthesize. In fact, here you can already see I was comparing two algorithms, this one and that one, right? And this was the ground truth. And you can kind of see, you know, which approximate inference gets you a better result, which one less, right? You can actually uh, compute, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, curves, you know, on, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the error of a topic vector estimation based on different number of topics, different number of si vocabulary sizes, and, uh, and so forth. So this, this is one way of evaluation. It's purely objective, very, very numerical. Okay? At least it gives you a conclusion about which approximation algorithm you know, is uh, more accurate in recovering the truth. <laughs> and of course, you can have empirical things like uh, computing the perplexity you know, you know, of your results, or computing the class label, you know, uh, Oops. So this is more kind of generic. You, you can download documents from some data sets for different topics, or different uh, uh, categories, and you can kind of uh, cluster or uh, classify you know, these uh, you know, uh, uh, documents based on your inferred topic vector, and they give you different accuracy estimations. That's another way. It's very empirical, All right? But again, it's an open topic in terms of how to precisely compare. And nowadays, I believe uh, in deep learning, these kind of uh, uh, exercises are rarely conducted. Okay, at the end of the day, it's about, it's almost like I teach a kid from year five, from age five, math, piano, baseball, everything. And then at year 20, I ask, did he go to CMU or not? Okay, and uh, uh, he, he did. Is that because he learned math or piano or baseball? I, honestly, there is no, no idea. Right. So deep learning is like this. You are competing, uh, comparing the end result of uh, classifying a image 
or uh, making a uh, translation right, but it's a whole middle ground of uh, latent uh, layers, uh, whether the inference was done correctly, whether the design of the layers having the right number, whether you have the right number of nodes, it is very, very unknown. That's why we say tuning the deep neural network, auto-tuning become a big business because uh, there isn't a, a great common ground for people to compare other than the end result. Uh, other questions? Take home message today is that uh, you want to know the variational inference principle, uh, in particular the mean field principle. Mean field is a very powerful tool. It, in principle, can solve arbitrarily complex model. Okay, you can have uh, a model with uh, whatever structure and whatever uh, number of nodes. By assuming mean field, you are literally removing all the nodes, all the edges. It becomes a product. Uh, a multiplication of uh, all the singletons. And uh, therefore, you can compute a, uh, a KL you know, uh, to draw the closest distances between every kind of, uh, uh, between the proxy and the true distribution. And then, you know, you can basically come up with approximation. And uh, in fact, uh, I just want to show this graph. This was an experiment uh, I did, in fact, as a graduate student about 15 years ago. Look at that. Isn't this a neural network? This is a neural network. It is a sigmoid network of, uh, of course, uh, four layers. At that time, things were very rigorous. Four layers because uh, we can compute exactly the value of the hidden nodes just by enumeration. Okay. Then we compared the back propagation algorithm with the mean field approximation and with some other twist of mean field. And you can actually see already the back propagation algorithm is terrible in terms of the accuracy of recovering the truth of the latent variables. So people knew it. It's not a very good algorithm in terms of accuracy. Okay. But it's very, very straightforward and simple. And the mean field is a little better. And there is a stretch mean field where you just cut some nodes, but not all the nodes. You can get a better accuracy like this. So this is just an insight. Whether it leads to better classification result at the end of the day, I don't know. But at least it gives you a uh, faithful estimation of the latent variables. Right. So you can see from this graph, the mean field uh, isn't just as simple as uh, cutting all the edges, like in here. Here I cut only the edges uh, between three boxes, make them basically a product of uh, uh, x block 1 and the product of uh, box two. Okay, so this is approximation, right? So this is actually known as the Kakuchi I just mentioned earlier, which was also invented in physics because in physics you need to really uh, assume you know different granularity of uh, molecular coupling, and therefore people you know tried one atom, two atoms, threes, and so forth, right? Okay, I think that's about uh, mean field approximation in variational. Uh, next uh, lecture, I will see. I'm thinking about presenting something even more hardcore on the math side, or something very dirty and the, and the practical on the application side. Uh, which way do you prefer, actually? Let me ask. Application. <laughs> Applications, you guys are not, okay. Uh, let me think about that. I, I can come up with something like that. Yeah. Hopefully today is an instance of application, right? You see actually at least topic modeling already how to do it. 